So hello, Adventure Racers, and welcome to USARA Live, the broadcast that brings the collective expertise of the most knowledgeable and experienced or not so experienced adventure racers and race directors together for group discussions on everything. RA social media assistant captain. And joining me today to talk about starting out in adventure racing is USA RA board member and co-founder of Rootstock Racing, Brent Friedland. Hey, Bill. Thanks. Uh, and thanks for everybody for joining us. Um, if you haven't had a chance to check out our new to AR resources on the USA RA website, um, I encourage you to do that. And we'll be, uh, I think, kind of diving a little bit deeper on some of the things I touched on in those articles tonight. Cool. Uh, Siegs, or Jen Seeger, uh, is, U is a USARA affiliated coach and 20-year veteran adventure racer based out of British Columbia who specializes in coaching women racers. How's it going, Jen? Hey, it's great. Great to be here and uh, great to talk all, uh, all things adventure racing tonight. And Brian Gatens is a school superintendent uh, at Emerson Board of Education in New Jersey. After growing tired of being told what route he had to follow in most races, he started adventure racing in 2001 and more recently has amassed expeditions all over the world. What's up, Ryan? Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Great. Uh, and Joe Medlin is joining us. He's a rookie adventure racer. Uh, he's going to get a chance to ask our panel some questions here in a few minutes. Um, and if anyone out there has a question, feel free to put it into the, the Facebook chat and hopefully I'll be able to see it and, and we'll, we'll get that to our panel. Um, but Brian, let's start with you. Uh, when did you get into adventure racing and, and how did you acquire your skill set? So um, my origin story is not unlike a lot of other adventure racers. I had been doing many multi-sport athletic, uh, athletic accomplishments over the years, uh, marathons, Ironman triathlons, a lot of outdoor stuff. Um, but I heard about adventure racing. I had seen Eco Challenge on YouTube and TV, and I Googled adventure racing, and I got connected with the New York Adventure Racing Association, reached out to them, and they hooked me up with Dan Brandon, who's a well-known adventure racer on the East Coast, and him and I did our first race together. Um, and my first race was a 30-hour race. I, I met Dan the night before the race. We started the next morning, and we had a fantastic time. Um, so that's how I got into this, just basically – after being told what direction to follow, I decided to follow somebody else around. And it's been fantastic ever since. <laughs> uh, Brent, you've been racing for, for 15 years, is it? Uh, you've designed courses. You've written a series of blogs for USARA about how to get started in, in adventure racing. Uh, there is so much to do, it can seem overwhelming with all the various disciplines and aspects, orienteering, foot, bike, paddle, training, teammates. Uh, what is the most important first step for someone who wants to get started in AR? Yeah, so um, I think it's probably a bit of a cliche in life, but really, honestly, I think it's you just got to throw yourself into the deep end and do it. You know, I, I think that adventure racing, like you said, there's there's so much to it. It can be really intimidating, um, you know, but I think you just have to kind of go for it and trust that you know, it, it's, it's going to be a much more accessible experience than you think. That said, um, I will give you a little bit more uh, detail because I think you're going to ask me for more anyway. Um, so I would say that I would focus on really thinking hard about who you go out into the race with. You know, I, I think having people that you feel comfortable with, teammates that you uh, know you are compatible with, that you're going to have a good time with, especially if things uh, don't go the way you expect them to. I think that's really crucial to a successful race. Um, you don't need to be super well trained. You don't need to be super skilled to go out and have a good time at an adventure race, especially when you're starting. But I think having people to really have fun with is important. Um, along those lines, I would also say setting realistic goals is really crucial, right? Um, adventure racing is a funny sport. Um, and it absolutely privileges experience. Um, you know, so even if you're super fit, I think going into the race really just with the mindset of like checking it out, experiencing it, having fun with it, and not worrying too much about results is really important. I think that's really different than a lot of other sports where people get focused on times and, you know, finished place and such. Um, the last thing I would say is I, I think it's really important to make sure someone on your team has at least a, a relatively... 
uh, comfortable skill level with navigation, right? You know, navigation is kind of the crucial thing. You can literally walk yourself through a lot of adventure racing courses. Um, so you don't, again, need to be super fit, but you need to know how to navigate. So um, somebody making sure that they are pretty comfortable with maps, I would say, is, is pretty important. Now, Brian, did you say that you only met your teammate for that very first 30-hour race the night before? Yeah, I, I reached out to Denise Matt from New York Adventure Racing Association, and she had said there's this gentleman named Dan Brandon. She connected us by email, and then him and I um, basically talked back and forth, and he, <laughs> I met this man on the internet. And he basically said, um, I'm staying here and I have a hotel room, so come crash here and we'll race the next day. And that's yeah. exactly what happened. And um, to key off on what, what Brent talked about, I think for the newer racer, I think that the greatest thing that they could bring to the race is a sense of enthusiasm, right? This is, this is a leisure time activity, right? Uh, we all have jobs that we're busy and you have to have a lot of fun. And so I think being into it and, and, and looking forward to the challenge of the race and also not using a lot of those metrics that you see in other races, to Brent's point, times and distances and speed, like those are very important and don't get me wrong. And I'm sure that Jen, when she goes, will talk a lot about the more formal aspects of that. Um, but the best thing to be in the beginning is into it and enthusiastic to be a good teammate, as was mentioned, is important too. And also in the beginning to focus on your strength. For a long time, the only thing that I was good at doing was carrying heavy stuff. I sunk at everything else. I couldn't nav and I didn't know food strategies and my feet fell apart. But if you gave me your gear to carry, I could do that for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. Jen, you've coached, um, you've worked with, as a coach, you've worked with adventure racers at all levels. Uh, how does someone train, especially for their first event, right? Um, you know, they might uh, see an ad for an upcoming local race and think, you know, that would be awesome. But I would need to train for months to get ready to do something like that. Uh, so what advice do you have to prepare for a first race that might be a month or two away? I think the first thing would be uh, to look at the race disciplines because every race is different. And sometimes you get a little bit of a gauge as to how much paddling, how much biking and how much trekking or running there is. So um, see what kind of boats you're going to be paddling, uh, what kind of terrain you're going to be in, or you can sort of expect to be in based on the area. And then really at that point, if you've only got, you know, a month or two to train, it's really just putting a little bit of time into each discipline. So get into the boat that you're going to be paddling, if it's a canoe or a kayak, you know, get a hang for, for paddling, for paddling with a partner and what that looks like and just getting comfortable in the boat. Um, you know, you don't have to at that point do a whole lot of, you know, intervals or whatnot. I would say just working on that basic foundation of time on bike, time on feet and try, trying to train, um, as close to the terrain type that you're going to be in. So if it's a rather flat race, something say down in Florida, you know, that looks very different. You don't need to spend a, time, a lot of time going up and down huge hills. You want to be working on probably going a little bit faster uh, on flatter terrain. But if it's hilly, then you need to spend some time, you know, um, going up and down some mountains, up and down some hills that you have access to. Uh, maybe that's even using a treadmill or a stair stepper to get that incline and get your legs ready for uh, what's coming. So really train to the, to the course in the area. And the second thing I would say is spend some time working on your nutrition. So by that, I mean learning how to eat and drink on the move. Um, you know, these races range anywhere from two hours, of, you know, up into 24, 36 or multi-day. Um, and the strategies for that look very different. But teaching your body how to intake calories right from the start and how to stay hydrated, uh, figuring out what tastes good for you, especially when you're working hard. Um, what kind of foods to eat biking, what's easy versus uh, what's not. And then from there, you sort of put that into a little bit of a plan and you just get out and practice. Um, and maybe that's even spending, you know, majority of your weekends doing that, but maybe during the weekday, you're balancing that with a heavy uh, work family commitment. So just starting to get comfortable with all the disciplines is what's the most important. And you, do you think a good teammate to have for their first race is someone who can carry a lot of heavy things? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Teammate selection is, is super important. And I think, uh, I, I think the great thing, though, about our sport is how uh, open and uh, accepting it is of everybody. So you could show up at a start line and ask questions to the person standing next to you, and people are going to share information. I mean, it, it's, it's a welcoming uh, sport. Yeah. So ask your questions. I, I realized um, a few years ago that having been racing for like 21 years now that like I'm the veteran 
<laughs> and like people like ask me questions and I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, wait a second. I do know. I've been doing this for a long time. Like, here's what I do. Um, so between the four of us, we've got like over 60 some years of experience, but Joe, Joe Medlin, you're our rookie racer. You just started racing. Tell us, how did you even get into this sport? What was that first race like that you just completed? Well, my sister-in-law looked this up and she's very athletic and we were going to do the uh, off-road racing. Had one in Warsaw in October. My wife had surgery, so I bailed and can't go off with your sister-in-law when your wife's home at surgery. So did not go do that race. She did the 12 hour. I don't think it was a great experience. It was fun, but they did not prepare for the navigating, which is key to the race. So we trained for this one last weekend in uh, Milford, Kansas. It was quite an experience. We did the eight hour. Um, speaking of training, I don't know if we did the right thing. We kind of treated it like a marathon. You don't ever run the full distance before the race. So about a week before we did 24 miles on bike and six miles on foot to try to prepare for the 30 and 10. Felt like that was the right thing to do, but um, yeah, we're, we're still learning. So I'll leave it at that. Um, there, there was a lot more things that we did not prepare for. Um, and I'll have some questions of you veteran guys and girls to help us understand what we did wrong and what we could do better. Well, that's an interesting question that, that you talk about the training and I hear that a lot. Uh, and Jen, maybe you, you can you can lead us off here. How much time do you really need to put in, right? Um, people think talk about this marathon, you know, you don't need to run the whole race as like your long day. Um, you know, what what is sort of ideal to be able to work up to in preparation for that first race, be it eight hours or like 30 hours? Well, I think I do think that's different for everybody. Um, and what it, you know, it comes down to essentially is carving out time in your week, whatever that looks like and making your training time count. So we all have different commitments and that's just the reality. Some people have six hours a week to train and other people have 20 hours. I mean, it's just very dependent. So I think what it comes down to is, uh, making the training count, uh, getting out there. And the number one thing I talk about with all my athletes is being consistent. So you don't want to go, you know, a week with doing absolutely nothing. And then the next week, just pile on the hours and then a week of doing absolutely nothing. So we're just looking for gradual buildup week after week. And that can become from a, from a volume standpoint, or maybe you start at four hours of training a week across all your disciplines, your, your paddle, your bike and your trek. Um, and then the next week, maybe you're able to add two more hours of training on. And maybe that long session on the weekend looks just a little bit longer and then the following week a little bit more so it's gradual buildup that's going to help keep uh injury rate down right and it's also going to just allow your body to adapt to the load and to the stress and demand of training but trying to be consistent is uh, the number one thing to think about so the fact that after i dropped my car off today at the mechanic i rode my bike home that counts Commuting, commuting counts, and uh, that's a great way to get some added time of training in during a week. Absolutely. Should have turned on Strava. Uh, <laughs> Joe, what was, the, what was your training like? You, you mentioned that long day. What was your training like even before? Like, you know, what, were you, were you, what kind of athlete were you before you did this race? Um, what was sort of your baseline starting out with? And, and now what are you thinking having done your first one as far as training moving forward? Um. Before, I'd been not training for an adventure race, but kind of reshaping my life over the last 15 months and, and changing eating and dieting habits. So this was kind of something that fit in with what I'd been doing. Uh, speaking of commuting, I ride about every day now at work, either after work or before. Um, just something that, something that I do just to clear my head. So that, that's just become a lifestyle change. And I was trying to get two to three miles in on a treadmill just to prepare for this. So leading up to it, we were doing a lot of small things and we live a couple towns apart, not real far, but 20, 30 minutes apart. So Saturdays were our big train days and we'd get together and, and those would be the days we would do a longer distance. And we started with 10 and then 15 and then up to 24 on our Saturdays building up to the race. Um, navigation was, was something that we really wanted to focus on after her 12 hour 
that was their biggest struggle. Um, I'm fortunate. I'm a park manager, so I have access to a 1,400-acre nature preserve, and we're building a trail at the time. So I marked some GPS coordinates, converted them to UTMs, and we went and played on the weekends with a compass and a topo trying to find the ribbons I put up out in the wilderness during the week, which, which helped, but there wasn't a whole lot of that in our race. Nothing was that bad extreme. Um, I kind of thought it might be, but they didn't have any checkpoints that were two miles off into the bush. So maybe that is on other races, but the one we did, it was not. So we may have over-prepared for navigation, but nothing wrong with being over-prepared. What do you think about that, Brent? I mean, you're a, you're a crack navigator, uh, one of the best in the business, um, uh, what do you, especially as a race director. Um, also, right, who's planned out these races. Uh, what do you think of, of Joe's strategy and, and what should he be prepared for moving forward? Well, I think, you know, Joe, you said it, I think being overprepared with navigation is always better than being underprepared, right? If you're, if you're underprepared, adventure racing can become quite, quite frustrating to say the least, right? And for a lot of people, they, they really struggle to get through the race because they can't figure out where they're going or they end up, you know, being able to move from transition area to transition area without getting a whole lot of checkpoints. So I don't think you did anything wrong. Um, and the reality is you will find other races that have much more intensive navigation. It may be, you know, I don't know um, uh, from firsthand experience what the race was like that you went to normally, but you know, when you get into that six to eight hour range event, um, those events tend to be geared a little bit more toward beginners, um, you know, and you'll still get, you know, very strong teams showing up who go out to try to, you know, race as fast as they can, but the navigation tends to be a little bit um, easier. You get into longer events, you're more likely to see those checkpoints two miles off a trail or significant foot sections with a lot of off-trail travel. I think orienteering events are one of the best ways to prepare in your off time, um, largely because they they kind of simulate um, adventure racing, right? In the sense that there's a, a course, it's laid out in order, you progress through the checkpoints. Um, orienteering events usually have a range of um, courses each weekend, right? So they'll have beginner-friendly um, events if you are new to the sport. Um, but as you get more comfortable with uh, navigation, you can kind of work up toward longer, more advanced courses. So I always say that it's a great training um, uh, venue for adventure racing, um, but it's also worth noting that adventure races um, rely on a different sort of navigation, right? So an orienteering race, you're going to get this great high-quality orienteering map. Um, occasionally you'll see that in an adventure race, but more often you're going to be working with a USGS topo map, which does not have the same level of detail or accuracy. So that can also be frustrating, but, um, orienteering events happen relatively frequently. They're cheap. Um, and you can really get out there and practice with the map. Yeah. Brian, as someone who was their first skill was carrying heavy things, have you learned navigation over time? Yeah, I, I think the I think the, the first off, Joe, great job on the race, right? Eight hours is a long time. You tell somebody you race for eight hours when you go to work on Monday and they think you're like a god. So well done on you and and ride that in the break room at work as long as you can. So you're an adventure racer, so welcome to the club. It's fantastic. I think the big thing with adventure racing is this, is that what it gives us the chance to do, it gives us a chance to identify the things that we're good at and the things that we're not good at. And over time, when we get into races and we race with good people, we could develop skill sets that we were, we were not very good at. From a former guy who could only pick up heavy things, I've been able to work on my navigation, my gear, my physical preparation, things like that. Um, and I think that that's the approach I would recommend to anybody who's on the call tonight when it comes to adventure racing is you have to have a mindset change that if you're coming into adventure racing for more traditional athletic activities, it's really about you doing something over time, right? So here's a marathon, run 26 miles in that direction, make a right and a left and come back when you're done and we'll have a medal for you. And that's where adventure racing is a bit different because we don't use standard measures of achievement. We can't get caught up in expecting those standard measures of achievement, right? It's all about the experience you have with the friends you race with 
It's about the highs and about the lows and about getting better over time. So for example, my navigation today is passable, much better than it ever was. I credit uh, Dan Brand and I credit, I credit a guy named Jim Mernon for teaching me along the way. And also to Brent's point, just getting into orienteering events, right? Having somebody put a map in your hand and you have a compass and say, go in that direction. And when you're lost and you're stumbling around, you just get better at it naturally. So I think that's really important. And along the way, you pick up gear tips, your training gets better. I think Jen was spot on when she mentioned consistency over time, right? I know for myself, like a lot of us, busy week at work, a lot to do. I try to carve out at least one good weekend day for a long effort. If it's a paddle, so be it. If it's a long bike ride, so be it. A day in the woods, so be it. And you have to wrap your training around your expectations, right? Um, there's a, a, a world-class adventure racer named Nathan Fave. He puts out these massive hours, these long races, these incredible efforts. That's all he does. He trains for adventure racing. He gets to go race across New Zealand. A guy like me, who's basically a schnook who works 60 hours a week, I do the best I can with what I have. Um, and then before I throw it back over, Joe, I mean, I just want to say that next time you want to race in Kansas, give me a call. I'll drive out and we'll rock that course. All right, count me in, right? You're my new teammate. So congratulations. Back it, to you, I would think that navigating in Kansas would be hard because there's no hills, right? It's like, what are you using to like figure out like where you are? Uh, and speaking of which, some of the comments um, uh, on, on Facebook talking about that Milford race, uh, CP12, they're saying, was a tough one. You remember that one at all, Joe, CP12? Does that one stand out? I do. I remember seeing everyone change their bike tires as they were getting to it and leaving it. Luckily, one of the more veteran riders yelled at us, carry your bikes, because there was black locust thorns everywhere. So we were fortunate. Sucks to carry your bike when you're on a road that you think you should ride down. But everyone that rode down, it had flats. So... They were, I was amazed how friendly and helpful every racer was. It was a great community. Uh, kudos to all you all that have been doing this. Everyone was helpful and friendly and jumping out there to mm -hmm. give advice mm -hmm. and, and do whatever they could. It was, it was a great experience as far as that's concerned. Uh, what's your gear kit like, Joe? What did you have to have for the race? What did you, what are you thinking about that you might need to get to keep going? Uh, for me, I'm a water consumer, um, and I probably should have carried more. I had a two-liter camel pack and then two liters on my bike, um, and I blazed through it pretty quick. And, and there was water refills, and I should have refilled when I was there because I didn't. And I, I just drink a lot of water, and I could have used more. That was as far as coaching and training. I needed a coach to tell me to carry more water. Um, even though it's heavy and it's not fun. But other than that, there wasn't a whole lot of gear required on the eight hours. Uh, you know, the flashy light and, and extra bike tube and stuff like that. But there wasn't any, any special gear required of us, which was kind of nice for a beginning race. So it was just things I kind of already owned and went after it. Yeah, and I think that most people think, oh my God, I need all this stuff. But I mean, I think the, the, my biggest investment when I started was a pack right? Just to get one that was sort of big enough and, you know, had some pockets and things like that to get going. But everything else I had, uh, what kind of bike were you riding? Because that's a big one. People are always like, oh, what's the, what bike should I get to mountain bike? Uh, what bike were you riding? And then what does our panel sort of recommend for especially a first bike? So when I knew I was doing this, I got on Craigslist and I bought a Trek 6800 26 inch mountain bike. I rode it for about three weeks and said, I could do better. So uh, I went and bought a uh, giant Talon, kind of a entry level mountain bike, something that was still road friendly because I knew I would ride to work every day. Um, and so I didn't want a true full suspension mountain bike. And I didn't think that would be a good choice for adventure racing. Uh, looking now, I wouldn't mind going with a smaller, lighter bike, but uh, I do like riding single track trails, so it, it's a good combination now. But yeah, the, the smaller, older bike would have worked. It just would not have been as easy to pedal and, and as fun to have. So my son has that now. So hopefully hopefully I can get him into this someday and, and we can do it as a team. And Brent, you're laughing. I know you've had your fair share of bikes, uh, some of which I think uh, have fallen off the roof of my car. 
uh, on the on the highway leading to a race. Um, and I'm thinking too about wheel choice and if tubeless would have maybe worked well for Joe in that section on CP12 with the thorns or, but you know, that might be a little bit more advanced, right? The next sort of bike. So, so what are your thoughts on, on bike choice? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that if you come to the sport with a fair bit of biking experience, it might be a different story than if you're really, truly new to it. Right. You know, I, I always, caution people that are really new to the entire world of adventure racing and all the different worlds it pulls together to not rush out and you know drop a ton of money on a bike right you know you might find that um you don't know as much about biking as you think you do you might find that adventure racing requires a different bike than you think you you do there's just a lot to kind of figure out so I think, you know, easing in, whether it's, you know, the beater bike you have in your garage that you haven't ridden in five years or even borrowing one, maybe investing in something off like a Craigslist where you don't have to necessarily break the bank for it and then kind of, you know, really talk to people and figure out what works. Um, you know, I will say that I'm a really big fan of um, 29ers. I think that's become the, the dominant bike in the sport, 29-inch um, tires. Um, you know, I think most more experienced adventure racers now are riding 29. I think there's even a shift now for some toward, what is it, 27 and a half or something like that. Uh, but I like 29 because it gives you a bit more of the cushion. And Joe, like you said, I think that's a good instinct. Um, personally, I like the 29 inch hardtail bike. I should say that I'm a relatively small person. So, um, you know, I can kind of get away without that full suspension, but a lot of adventure race riding is relatively tame, right? I think that's a bit of a misconception. I mean, you will find single track riding. You will definitely find races with some pretty intense um, sections of technical riding, but a lot of adventure racing riding kind of over time tends to be dirt roads, um, even a fair bit of pavement. Um, you know, so I think that getting away with a full suspension bike um, works for a lot of racers. But I think a lot of it's what you're comfortable with, right? So I've pretty much been riding, you know, um, front suspension only for about 10 years. I did briefly have a full suspension bike when I started. I got one um, thinking that that's what I wanted and then decided that I didn't need it. And it was one more working part to take care of with maintenance. So those are my two cents on bikes. Ryan, what, bike, what kind of bike are you on? I, I don't remember. I think it's a Scott. I think it's a 29er. I know it's a hardtail. Um, I, I do want to make space for Jen to comment because she's the smartest one among us when it comes to the training and the coaching and the racing. But I, I will say this for the newcomer who wants to jump into the sport. It, I, I've raced across the spectrum. I've done triathlon. I've done road bike racing. I've done a lot of things. Adventure racers, for the most part, are the most gear unconscious people that exist that you don't need to show up with the perfect gear at the perfect time for the perfect race, that nobody's looking at your bike or your pack or your gear on the start line. Nobody jumps into the sport having all of these things ready. So when you show up with a, a 26 or beater bike and you show up with a pack that looks like a fellow of a Cub Scout bandwagon, like that's cool, like we're cheering you on. And then over time you build yourself into a greater level of gear. And, and I share that because adventure racing besides being a long name for a sport, feels like it's a lot to swallow when you're getting into the sport, right? It's, it's adventure racing, right? I need to, I need to look like Indiana Jones uh, and I need to, I need to race like that person. Literally show up with your Hello Kitty backpack, ride the bicycle that you own, take the maps and go get them. And what you will find, and I think this was Joe's experience, is that fellow racers from the folks who are racing a week more than you to those who are racing 20 years will cheer you on. I found it to be the most fellow racer supportive supportive sport that exists um, Ryan, I, and I've want, always thought you've looked like indiana jones but i do I, love yeah. hello kitty backpack thank you thank you i'll have that at the next race when i'm out in kansas with joe Thanks. what are you thinking here about bikes and on a completely selfish note i'm really bad at riding uphill what do i do to get stronger <laughs> well let's just talk about the bike there for a second because i spot on to what um you know brian and brent have said um I think once you just try it, you know, you get that first race done, you're on whatever bike, but then you'll start to see that I think the bike fit is really important and being that will help with your efficiency. So, you know, if you're riding with your saddle, that's too low or a frame that's too small, I mean, you just can't generate the power. It gets uncomfortable. You know, you start getting the leg cramps, your back is hurting. So the next thing would be like going to be 
yeah, how does your bike fit? And, and visiting your local bike shop and, and getting a feel for what's going to be good. And then from that, I mean, that makes, that's a really big jump up to in, um, you know, the kind of power you're going to be able to generate and how long you're going to be able to sit on your bike for and how much easier hills are going to be. So that's my two cents on the bikes. And what was your next question? How do I get better at climbing hills besides getting a better fit on my bike? <laughs> Lose some weight. <laughs> yeah, lots of things. I mean, during the off season or even coming into in season, strength training does wonders. Um, so I really encourage uh, strength training for athletes. Um, that's going to help with your power generation. Of course, just doing hills. Um, circling back to what we talked about earlier, it's important to train your weakness. So, um, and that can be in, in every discipline or just whatever discipline. So if biking up hills is not your thing, you need to start tackling hills to improve. Um, and so that could be using the train that's around you. That could be hopping on, you know, some of the indoor programs like Z-Wift, um, you know, or Trainer Road and putting some time in on that. Um, but yeah, doing, doing some good hill repeats. Um, if you don't have hills around and you're going somewhere, you know, doing some different intervals or doing some rides um, where you're biking in your big ring. So it's going to be a slower cadence, okay? And you're having to generate um, some good power from a seated position. So you can really simulate a lot, even if you don't have access to hills around. But don't shy away from a hill. The more you do them, the easier they get. Facebook is telling me that Kansas has hills. And I think I remember a study that said that Kansas was flatter than a pancake. Uh, so maybe I'm wrong, right? Um, but Joe, what are you thinking here? How are some of these tips translating for you? They're great. Um, and I will say Kansas doesn't have steep hills. They have long, slow climbs, which I would rather have the steep because the faster you go up it, the faster you go down it. The, the long half mile climb is not what I like, but it, it's what they have. So you, you embrace it. And they have wind. That, that's the other fun thing. They had lots of wind. Um, one question I have, and you don't mind me asking, is studying other than the map. I felt a little left behind and it may be because people have done this race and they've had it in this area a couple times. We were shocked. We would be on a road and find a checkpoint and find right next to the checkpoint, a trail that's not on the map. And it seemed like everyone knew the trails, but us. Is that normal? Do you do pre-study of map area? Do you, I mean, how does that work and what, quote unquote legal and you know we, we were tried to be very conscious didn't look at any satellite imagery tried to be when we planned our race we got our maps the night before we tried to be as legit as possible and i i, I told uh bill that coming into this we were gonna go with what we had and he offered to let me ask questions before the race and i turned it down because i wanted to see what we could do being strict newbies and that was one thing I was shocked. It seemed like people knew things that weren't on the map. So if anyone could offer some ideas, that would be great. My, one of my favorite pastimes is teasing Brent's wife about where their race is going to be. They like to try and like keep it under wraps. And I'm always trying to like get it out of them uh, for that sort of, because uh, they, they like to closely guard it so people can't, you know, go out and scout too much before the race. So what do we think as far as studying maps? Is it pre-knowledge? Is it local knowledge? Or is it like, I'm going to take a chance with this trail that seems to be going, what does your sign say, Brian? Up is north? Yeah, remember, north is always up. That's what the sign says. North is always up. And I, I think to the, to the map question that Joe talked about, so it depends upon, so uh, a, a, lovely, a lovely side effect of the sport is when you find out where a race is going to be held and they say it's in a certain area, there's definitely a lot of pre-race banter that exists between racers about the course, right? We, we speculate and we think and we have ideas. We did a race called the Two Rivers Adventure Race um, that was put on near World's End, actual name of a park, by the way, in Pennsylvania is World's End, um, that we had speculated on one of Brent and Abby's races, and we had this massive guessing game of where the race was going to be in the exact opposite direction. We were completely wrong, and we went down the Loyal Sock River. We went into Loyal Sock River, too, and that's a whole other story. Um, and so I think that it's worth pointing out that you are definitely allowed to speculate about the, the, the course and how it's going to go out. Where it, where, it, where it falls apart is if you're in the race <laughs> and you take your phone out of your pocket, 
that's a no-no, right? You're not supposed to do that at all during the race. Another thing I'll add to is this, is that the, with this, and this blows a lot of people's minds and we sometimes forget to say it out loud. While you get mapped, you pick your entire own route. So while it feels like the herd kind of follows a certain direction on a map, you could see uh, a, a, a line on a map that looks like it could be something and you could go there and go in that direction. Um, but there's definitely speculation about the location and about the area beforehand, which is all good fun. It's all good fun. And it's actually, it's a great way to sort of get ready for the race. And everyone has a map box of old maps. It's a must. Yeah. So i uh, just add a couple of things. So Joe, um, you know, to your point about kind of like the up and up, right. You know, first of all, I, I think that it actually shows that you are meant to be in the sport that you're thinking about the, the morality of your pre-race planning. Um, I definitely felt, uh, I had a lot of those same questions when I started racing you know, so I think that it's all in the fine print of each race, right? And, you know, this is one of the, the great things about our sport. And it's one of the challenging things is every race is different, right? You know, so unlike triathlon, marathon, Ironman, where everything is like much more standardized, you can do a race in British Columbia or Hawaii or Singapore, and they're all going to virtually be the same and play by the same rules. Adventure racing, it's really up to the race director. So, you know, some race directors... Um, like like it sounds like yours did gave the course out gave you the maps the night before right and unless they explicitly said you may not do x y or z anything is fair game really right so i'm sure that there were adventure racers at that race using satellite imagery right um, there are other races where, you know, they save the maps until sometimes even the race has started, right? You, you look at your maps on the clock, which really removes that aspect of race planning and kind of levels the field, like you were saying. You know, another thing that's common is um, some race directors will explicitly state no outside maps allowed. Others will allow you to use outside maps, right? Some race directors um, really make a lot of effort to make sure that all relevant or useful trails are on the maps that they give you. Others don't. Um, so I think that it really comes down to just kind of being aware of that reality and, you know, looking at the pre-race communications that the race director sends you um, and kind of knowing what's fair and what's not. And knowing that if they don't explicitly say no, Everything is fair game and there will be teams doing those things if they are not prevented from doing so, in which case you should absolutely do that. Though I will caution you, um, while sometimes these are wonderful things that pay off, I have been burned many times by satellite imagery that suggests that there's a great alternative route. And then I find that it was really a disaster and I shouldn't have paid attention to that satellite imagery because it didn't show me that the road was covered in thorns, right? Um, yeah, so yeah, I hope that helps give you, gives you some insight, but again, kind of to your earlier question, every race and every race director is different. So another thing that can be super useful is before you sign up for a race or right after you sign up for it, do a little bit of research, um, you know, and see if you can find people that have done the race or online race reports and see if you can glean some information about how that particular race tends to work. That's great. Super helpful. Um, and, and that was the, the biggest question was, and it didn't say you couldn't, so I'm assuming you could use other maps. It was in a state park. And now the 24-hour race, they only got, I think, 30% of the map the night before. And then at checkpoint two, I believe they got the other 70. So they had to stop in the middle, which made it, we, we were a beginner's eight hours. They had a kind of nice to us, I guess and didn't throw us to the wolves. But that was my question. Being a state park, like most other state parks, they have mountain biking trails that are not on the map, but you could grab a Milford State Park mountain biking trail that would show you this amazing trail system that doesn't show up on a topo. That's what I wish I would have had. But if it doesn't say you can't have other maps, normally it is allowed. Okay, that, that, that is super helpful to know. In, in general, I would also just add, you know, beyond the question about maps, you know, adventure racing is one of those sports where interpretations of rules really is a skill and an art. And some teams are way better at it than others. 
But, um, you know, honestly, I think it can get a little sticky once in a while because I think sometimes race directors just don't necessarily realize that what they're either putting on paper or not putting on paper can be interpreted certain ways. You know, the race director usually has something in their mind as to what they intend teams to do in terms of the rules and things like that. Um, but, you know, if it's not explicitly written or stated, um, creativity and flexibility and innovation on the course is part of the sport. So if, if I could add a comment to that, Brent, you might want to speak to this also is when you if you are to race through a populated area. Right. We did a race up in Maine that took us through Portland, Maine on a Saturday night, which was we looked like we were Martians. Right. We came out of the woods covered in mud and gunk and all of a sudden we're running down Main Street in Portland. And you are allowed to source local help, right? So we were in Portland and we're like, and we showed somebody in the map and said, can you help us with this? It didn't say that you couldn't speak with local talents in terms of where you were going. Now, I would argue, and to your point, Brent, that is far different from saying to somebody you know, you know, meet me in Portland at eight o'clock on a Saturday night and have the van full of Gatorade and goose. Like that is unethical and that is beside the point. But that race, we made a hard left, went into five guys and bought ourselves dinner, right? Five guys burgers and we bought ourselves dinner and there's always coffee on courses. And so to Brent's point, you make this up as you go along. And to, and to your credit, Joe, you were thoughtful about the, the ethical approach you would bring to the race. And it sounds like you stayed right inside of it. And that's great. And that's what the sport is. I mean, come on, if, if you're going to go, if you're going to come up for work and go cheat an adventure race, you need to go talk to a therapist. I mean, this is a leisure time activity. You, you, if you're, if you have to cheat out here, like, Go talk to somebody, figure that out. But I mean, that's the way I look at it. It's about having fun. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think. Go, sorry, go ahead. I say, Brian, I, yeah, I was just going to say, I think really this all just sums up to the fact that it's about being flexible. And that's what makes this sport so unique. Expect anything. You could be thinking you're on a bike leg and all of a sudden it's a stop and you're going off on a little row game trek for 15, 20 kilometers that nobody knew was going to happen. Um, that's what makes adventure racing unique and different is just be prepared for anything at any given time. Things change, courses change, and uh, you just have to come in with that mindset. And so how does one train for that sort of mental aspect to adventure racing? Yeah, I think um, the more experience you get in the sport, just the more you do it, you, uh, you learn that that's how the sport, sport works. And so when you show up for race day, you're just ready for whatever. And you come in with that, that attitude. Um, and you come in with um, no sort of set expectations in terms of how long this course might take uh, or what's going to be waiting for you out there. So I think that's a really good thing to bring into your training as well. When you go out for, say, a long day on your bike and suddenly um, you find yourself lost or you find yourself with three flat tires. It's how you do with it in the moment. Okay. You run out of water. What do you do? Okay. You've got to start being resourceful. You start looking for streams. You knock on somebody's door, um, all these things. And so you don't get all rattled up when things just aren't laying out in this beautiful, um, format in which you expected. So, um, be open to everything and, uh, just learn how to deal with adversity. That's, that's what adventure racers do. Brian, what you got? Yeah, I, I, I spot on, right? The idea that, that this is the first word adventure racing is adventure, right? And sometimes when things go south, we, we did a race one time in Scotland where it was, we're coming off a long, long trekking leg, 18 hours on this trek, and we thought we'd get to the TA, we'd, we'd get our tents out, we'd take a two-hour nap, and we'd get back out on the course. We got to the transition area, the TA, which was a community hall in, in the Highlands, and they said, we're closing this facility in 20 minutes, get your stuff and go. And we were spit back out onto the course, and we ended up taking refuge in a public bathroom. I know, glamorous sport that we have here. But to, to, to Jen's point, and as Bren touched on, as we know, that's when it gets very adventurous, right? And after begging, after begging a hotel to let us sleep in their garage and being told no, and realizing we wouldn't fit inside the bus shelter, the public bathroom became our next best option. And there's a famous picture out there of one of our teammates looking like he was about to die sleeping on the floor. That's what you sign up for when you sign up for adventure racing. If you don't want that, well, that's cool. Go do an Ironman. So uh, 
Sorry, I was I'm I'm trying to figure out. Apparently, I'm frozen on Facebook, so I hope people can can actually hear me. Um, <laughs> well, I, I figure you guys can. You seem to be responding to my questions. Uh, Joe, uh, any other questions you have for our panel? Um, at what point does someone decide they want to go from an eight to twelve to a twenty-four? Um, I don't know if I ever see myself 100 plus miles on a bike, but maybe, I don't know. I mean, and we finished this one and I was like, I had four more hours in me, I think. Um, if I would have refilled my water, definitely had four more hours. Um, but I don't know. I mean, what is that jump and what does it look like to have, and I know all finishes are different, but being a competitive person, I had no expectations of finishing great. My expectation was I'd love to be in the top 50%. We almost made it in our division, but didn't. Um, and then on training, how do you know when to say, is it better to go for checkpoints and be late or not go for them? And that's what we chose. We, we stopped at 16 of 30 and said, I don't know if we can ride back in that time. And we came back and looked for one that we'd missed and still didn't find it because um, we ran out of time. And we decided it was that my goal was to be back at five. That was our cutoff was five. And I did not want to be late. Is that the right attitude? Or what, what angle would you all recommend on this racing? I mean, I'll tackle the the first part, um, you know, just the uh, the question about how do you move up, right? So when I started in the sport 15-ish years ago, I started with a six-hour race and it terrified me, um, like really terrified me. I'd never like done a running race, never really, I mean, I like road bikes as a kid for fun, but like had never mountain biked, um, had done all, been like an outdoors person, but never like a sport person. Um, did a six hour race. Um, and Joe had a similar kind of goal. Well, I actually honestly was just like, I don't want to be last that that was my goal was not to be last. And we finished like right in the middle of the pack. I think there were 150 teams and we were like somewhere around 75th. Right. Um, and I had the same feeling you did where I was like, Oh, I could have done more. Um, and, uh, so by the end of my first season, I had signed up for a 12-hour race and um, had a similar kind of feeling at the end of like, oh, that, that wasn't as hard as I thought, right? I mean, there were parts of it that were really hard, but I finished, you know, smiling, thought I had a great time, and that's really all that mattered. So, you know, the next season I did a 24-hour race. And then I was racing in my first national championship and within a couple of years, my first multi-day race and then on a nationally competitive team. And that's obviously not the trajectory for everybody. But, you know, I think, as we said at the beginning, and I think Brian was showing the same thing with his, with his hand motions, it's a sport that really rewards bravery, right? And courage. And it, it's just like, just go for it and it will give back to you. Um, I do really still firmly believe that being surrounded by the right people is really important to that. You know, the, the times I hear of adventure racers who don't fall in love with the sport, um, I, I almost always hear people talking about it because they've had bad teammate experiences, right? And they just haven't had that opportunity to race with people who have made it fun, results aside, right? And that, that's everyone from, you know, competitive athletes the teams that are always at the back of the pack, but just like out for a good weekend. So I would say if you feel like you've got it in you and you've got someone to do it with, um, or you're willing to take a shot on someone you don't necessarily know, but sounds like might be a good fit, just go for it and see how it goes. Jen, what can you add here, especially about the training to get up to the that next level? I'll just uh, begin there by saying too, I think, the one thing is um, with the longer races is you have to want to be out there. So you have to just be up for the adventure and the roller coaster that comes with it. Um, and that's part of the fun. I mean, you go through your 12 hour race or eight and then you're like, wow, it'd be really cool to see how do I move at night with lights on and like what's night biking all about. Right. And, and then, and through that, you just, these team bonds form if you're with the right people and you're just, it's, it's a lot of fun, right? You're getting lost together. You're summiting mountains together. Um, and then you just realize what you've just done really is have this incredible experience with a few other people in the middle of nowhere. And I, for me, that's sort of what became addictive was just 
group adventure aside from all the other competitive side of stuff it was just you having a great time with your friends out there and and like i said wanting to be out there because uh when things get low it's really easy to quit and to pull the pin and uh so i think i think you'll know when you're when you're just ready for longer and you feel motivated by that you'll be ready to take the the next jump um i will say too that it doesn't have to be a linear um process either of like eight hours, 12 hours, 24, 36, two days. I have people come to me who are like, they've heard about a race in a foreign place, um, you know, whatever came up in Croatia and they're like, oh, I've always wanted to go to Croatia. I, I want to just tackle a big, long race. They just like being out there for a long time. Um, and so that's just how they start on the sport, multi-day expedition racing. So I, I think uh, as long as you are able to carve out the time to prepare so i think that's a big conversation with you know those around you your family uh, work and things to be able to put the time in because ultimately what you have to be able to do is build up structurally so that your joints and tendons can handle you know big long sections so now we're talking not just being on your feet for two hours at a time it's possibly being in a trekking leg for 48 hours right so having that time um you know to prepare is is really important you know i've seen it i've seen people prepare for expedition races though let's say on average of eight to ten hours a week and then every you know maybe second or third weekend they've got that full weekend that full saturday sunday to really uh put some big adventure together and go out and put in big 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 hours and, and get that experience in that time um so i think that's what's really important again um you know looking at the race disciplines to what they what that offers if there's going to be you know huge paddling sections but you don't have any access to a boat or water or things like that you know maybe uh you want to get some more experience in that sort of avenue before you tackle a race that goes off into one of the disciplines that maybe is just a little harder for you to to train in um so that's that's what i would say from making the jump Jen, you mentioned someone who raced in Croatia. Uh, where is the most like exotic or kind of different out of your element place that you've ever raced? That's a tricky question because I mean, I really use my racing to travel the world. That I knew that when I was 20 years old, it would be a way to see the world and see places tourists don't get to go because you go to such remote nooks and crannies. Um, I was really drawn to Brazil. I think we raced there three for three years. Um, yeah, that's... But I don't know, gosh, there, races come and go all over the place. Um, so it's neat to see what appears on the calendar every year and, uh, and what the races are. Uh, how about you, Brian? Where, where are some of the, the crazier places you've, you've raced? Well, the, the, the uh, Itara Scotland was the, was the big one that I did overseas. It was a great international experience. We were the only American team that was there, and that was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And Europeans can race, and they're quick, and they're a blast. A lot, a lot of fun. I, I, I will share that for, for all the fun races I've had, and I'm not saying it just because he's on the call, but several years ago, Brent Navi put together a race called Two Rivers, which was down in Wilmington, Delaware. It was, it was, it was and that was just, I mean, it's basically in, it's basically in your backyard living in the Northeast. And it was this perfect combination of challenging terrain, great course placement, a lot of fun to race with. And it was the whole experience. Um, and so I think that that was one of my favorite races was literally right here. Um, I heard the Croatia race is amazing, Jen. I heard that's an amazing, they just love having it there. But if, uh, if I could wave a magic wand, I'd go down to Patagonia, Patagonian expedition race. If I could just be teleported someplace else, send me, let's go right now. I'll drive to the airport. Sorry to my wife who's listening to the call. Yeah, see just make sure months. you check in with your wife. She's got chores for you to do before you leave, is what yeah, I'm I heard I'm getting hammered on the comments. So I'll, <laughs> I'll be sleeping in Jen's backyard tonight. <laughs> uh, my most exotic locale was Wisconsin, uh, which is where USARA Nationals is, I think, this year. Uh, and I, I got a crazy story about getting there. Um, while we're, we're getting a little bit short on time, uh, so there were some other questions that came in um, mostly beforehand. Uh, I tried to look in the chat and I think it was really slowing up my, my internet feed. Only so much uh, bandwidth here at uh, social media assistant captain headquarters. Uh, that is my basement. But um, so a couple other questions. Uh, let's see, volunteering at races. How important is that? Anyone? I mean, I, I, 
I don't know if it's important, but I think it's a really fascinating insight into what goes into an adventure race, which I do think can at least make you appreciate the sport more and what race directors go through to put on the event, right? I, I Like any event, it's easy to get frustrated with the people designing the race, but I think when you see what's going on behind the scenes, it, it kind of helps you uh, more fully appreciate it. So I don't know if it necessarily impacts your racing or not, but. I do think it's a nice thing to be able to give back to the sport as well. Um, race directors put a lot of effort into it. We rarely have as many volunteers as we would like to have, you know, so, you know, if you can say once a year, I think if every racer would say once a year, I'm going to volunteer to race, we would have better races overall. So. Yeah. And it, it's always been a great way for me to meet people and, and gain knowledge. Uh, a question about paddling. Uh, one of the harder ones to sort of train for, not many people, I think, do it or have access to it, right? How does one, does one even really need to train for paddling, right? I mean, you just get in the boat, you sit there and and, and you paddle, right? I mean, do you really train for this? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, in a short race, um, the gap between probably the up front, um, you know, uh, guys going really fast and the back of the pass may not be that significant. Let's say it's a paddle of five to 10 only in a shorter race or something, you know, everyone's going to get, you know, likely through the paddling section and off the water in a reasonable amount of time. But as the race gets longer and those paddle legs get longer, that's where you really see the paddling teams who train for paddling stand out. Um, they're just so efficient. Their, bo their boats move so much quicker. Um, the fatigue doesn't set in. And, um, you know, races can easily be win or loss just based off teams who can paddle well and those who can't. So something to consider for sure. Put the time in to the, into the paddling. Uh, got a question here about feet. Uh, they've been training um, since last summer uh, and their feet have just sort of taken a beating, right? Which I don't know exactly what that means, but I know my feet have gone through uh, various points of pain. Um, and calluses and blisters and everything like that. And Brian, I think even you mentioned this uh, earlier, um, but what, what are some of the, the, the foot strengthening techniques or even foot care techniques during a race? And let me start, my feet defeated me two years in a row in a race called the Stockville. Knocked me out of the race and it just, it, it, it shattered me. And I, I actually went on a, a, a foot preparation strategy and, and I actually spoke to somebody and it was all about, you know, the way you toughen your feet and, and not to get too into the grisly details, walk around as barefoot as much as you want, dial in your sock shoe combination, use something called hike goo or foot goo. You have to take care of your feet during a race. Uh, if they, if they fall apart on you, you're, you're not walking on your hands, right? And so you have to focus on that. And another part of it too, is getting yourself um, practicing with, everything below the ankle and having big long days out there in the woods, walking in the same combination you'll use in a race. I'm sure that Jen probably tells her athletes, do nothing new on race day, right? What you've been training in, you do inside the race and your, your feet over time do come together. Um, and also another great piece of advice that I got when it came to that was every single time you could, if you're in a transition area or to break, get everything dry, get as much stuff dry as you can. Um, wet, wet socks, shoes, and feet just stay disintegrate over time. That's what Lieutenant Dan told Forrest Gump, dry socks. See, exactly. Yeah, I'll also just add to that, that, um, you know, hydration plays a big role as well um, in blister prevention. So when you're getting adequate hydration and electrolytes, that can really help. Okay, that also helps with keeping foot swelling down. So, uh, and, and the swelling of the extremities, you know, especially like, you know, puffy hands and things like that too. So really staying on top of hydration and electrolytes is really important and a lot of people don't make that connection. Um, the other thing I would say too is the longer the race, you may wanna look at going into a half size bigger of a shoe, especially for trekking. Um, even potentially, you know, bike shoes, if you have that second pair that's just a little bit bigger, you know, the longer the race, just the more, um, the more things that, you know, happen. So it's good to have that extra little bit of space to allow your feet to go out to. Um, for me personally, going into any kind of race, I actually get a pedicure and that sounds really funny, but um, why I do that is to remove calluses, okay? Because calluses essentially just, although they, they help toughen up the feet and people think they're great, they also become really good pockets for holding uh, water in them. So I actually remove, not down to like nothing, but I really work on my calluses, get those removed down. I trim all the toenails down 
And then several days prior, and I learned this great technique from uh, Roy Malone of Team Bones, who never seems to have a blister ever in multi-day races, is start prepping my feet with that foot goo product that Brian uh, mentioned, you know, starting three days out and sleeping with socks on, putting more, more um, of that goo repellent on. And that process starts three days out from a race um, and it worked wonders, okay? And then the final backup thing I do is I carry a product called Luco Tape, which is essentially a stretchy physio tape. I think there's KT tape as well. Um, and once that stuff is on your feet, so let's say areas maybe you're really prone to a blister like in the heels or uh, tape toenails down, that kind of thing. Um, I do all that before the race. Uh, so that I know I'm just set and ready come race time. And that stuff stays on uh, really good. I find, you know, blister pads and things like that. That stuff comes, comes off. As soon as you're into a wet section, that stuff's done and, and gone. So that's that's what I do. Brent, I know have, you love feet, Brent. What do you got for me? Yeah, I was just, I mean, 200% with everything Brian and, and Jen have said. Um, the one other thing I would just add, and you can apply this to a lot of other things too, is just like ask for help, right? Like adventure racers, to a fault, get really stubborn and, you know, feel like, oh, I don't want to stop. Like we're almost to the TA and almost in an expedition race might be four hours away. Um, you know, or like, I don't want to slow down my teammates, whatever. Um, you know, and you could catch a foot problem early and prevent it from becoming an issue, or you can let it turn into like a legitimately problematic infected blister that knocks you out of the race. Right. So, just, um, you know, taking the two minutes to deal with a foot problem or five minutes or 10 minutes, it's worth it if, if it really kind of uh, allows you to finish the race or finish it, you know, hours faster than you might if you're having to be carried by a teammate. So just take care of your feet, you know, when it happens, take care of it. And I think we have a future USARA live plan where we talk about team dynamics um, because it's just fascinating to me. Um, um, Joe, do you have any, is there any question you have that we didn't get to? Um, I'll direct this toward Brent. Um, since you put on races, how do you go about looking at more races and more places? Oklahoma doesn't have any. Um, I think they did at one point. Would love to have one in Oklahoma. How do you go about finding someone? And I've talk, I talked to the people that put on the one up in Kansas. How, how do you look at growing that? And, and is there a way to foster that into a state that doesn't have any? That's, a, that's an awesome question, Joe. I mean, I think that, um, you know, as you may know, um, I am part of a group that has just taken over USA Array, right? Um, you know, USA Array has been doing a lot of great work for the last 20 years under the leadership of Troy Farrar, who was the founder of it back in the, the late 90s. Um, you know, one of our goals and one of Troy's goals was, was always to be there as a resource for local race directors. Um, you know, honestly, I think that, you know, we don't have the resources to necessarily proactively start a race in Oklahoma. But if there were local racers that were enthusiastic about the sport that wanted to start a local organization, um, you know, we as USARA can work to help, right, foster that growth, right? So, you know, it's not necessarily a, a, a definitive answer to your question, but, you know, I think if there's people on the ground that, that wanna get into it, even if they're not super experienced with the sport, um, you know, we can kind of help them with that. I will say that said, um, I really, not to at all, um, I, I don't wanna come across as disparaging at all in any kind of way, I do think race experience counts an awful lot to successful race directing though. Um, you know, so I think that, uh, you know, if somebody was interested in, in, in joining kind of the kind of community of race directors, I think making sure that they kind of get out there and race and not just race their local events, but really try to go see a, a variety of different race directors, different kind of levels of races, different styles of race directing, that's all gonna make you a better race director right? Um, you know, race directing is no joke. It, it, it's a really difficult thing to do and to do well. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of kind of um, safety considerations that go, in, that go into that. So really being able to um, feel confident in your ability to direct both a rewarding race for racers of all levels, right? Because that's an additional challenge is you're designing a race for, for new racers 
like you, but also maybe, you know, national or even world champion racers, um, you know, because uh, the, the community is small. Uh, but being able to put together a great course while also balancing safety and permitting and, you know, all of those kinds of expectations that go into designing an event. So, you know, for you as a racer, I would, you know, you've probably already done it, but, you know, point you toward the calendar resources on USARA's website, right? Um, and unfortunately, unless you happen to live on the East Coast, we were talking about this as a group before uh, we went live tonight, you know, um, much of the rest of the country, this the racing is pretty spread out. Um, so you have to be prepared to, to put some effort into traveling to be able to kind of get your fix, unfortunately. But um, I would encourage you to do it, you know, even if it's like once or twice a year, you know, driving an extra handful of hours to get somewhere further afield, um, get out there and try different race directors. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I think we're we're already looking at going back to Kansas and maybe Missouri, and then there's one in Little Rock. So we're trying to look at that calendar and figure out where to fall. And dates are still up in the air with COVID and stuff in some places. So it, it, that that's made it a hard year to try to jump into this sport. So, but I appreciate the answer. That was kind of what I was assuming. Looking what it took to put on the race in Kansas, that is a beast that I super super proud you can do those things because that looked like a lot of work so where do you where do you live joe i live in a uh, tulsa metro area okay yep yeah and i mean i know there are several organizations down in texas as well um you know that are putting on events some of which are i think coming back from a long hiatus so that might be another direction to look as well thank you and we are planning forums uh, for race directors as well to try and get some of their, their questions uh, uh, answered. Um, but we are running out of time. Um, so uh, I wanted to uh, let our panelists chime in with anything that, that they were itching, dying to say, or, or questions that they've heard over time um, that they think are important for people who are new to adventure racing to know. Brian, why don't we start with you? Sure, I, I think for um, what has been made abundantly clear tonight in our call with, with the experience that I would see that Jen and, and Brent bring to the table and Joe being um, new with the sport is the idea that adventure racing is like no other sport, right? And so, and so comparison is the thief of joy. So what you shouldn't do is don't compare the adventure race to a, another type of race dynamic is completely different. Um, get yourselves with people, get alongside people who are fun to race with, who are challenging, who will push you and will carry you. Um, when you begin to do the longer races, everybody's going to feel crummy at some time. And so you have to keep an eye out for each other and you have to bring people along. And it's amazing how a well-timed Snickers bar and a cup of coffee will, will just bring everybody's spirits up. I mean, it's, it's a very, very common activity. Um, and, I, and I'll say to Jody, your question, um, I have the, the honor and the privilege of working alongside Aaron Corain, and we're putting on a six-hour adventure race in Grafton Lake State Park up here in, in New York State, outside of uh, Albany. Um, and so my, my growth is somewhat organic over time, right? Doing a lot of racing involved in New York Adventure Racing Association and having the, 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 the honor of working alongside Aaron and seeing the, the amount of work that goes into this. So my advice to you is keep racing, keep doing your thing, learn about the sport, dive right into it, use, use the Hello Kitty backpack, no one's judging you, it's a safe space. And then if possible, you know, feel free to volunteer and, and help someone out along plan a race, then you will build that skill set and bring the same thing to Tulsa. So, so thanks. And, and, and Bill, I appreciate USARA giving me the chance to talk out loud about this stuff tonight. I am just excited for the upcoming race season. I want everyone to be safe and have fun. So thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you, Brian. Siegs, what do you, what do you have to, to leave us with? I think, Brian, uh, that was just a great, uh, a great sum up. Uh, really, it is. Um, you know, it's about having fun and uh, your teammates. And uh, like I said earlier, um, training your weakness right? Just getting out there, throwing yourself into the sport, uh, working on all the disciplines. Um, the speed will come, you know, along with that, then will be able, will come that faster navigation down the road. And that's just what's going to ultimately, you know, the team is just going to move um, that much faster. But um, yeah, work on, the, work on the areas of your game that um, you're not as familiar with and that you're not as comfortable with and just work to elevate those things up. Um, get the experienced um, be consistent with your training uh, as the weeks go on and the months go on. Um, and the more experience, the more races you do, the more just adventures you put yourself into, the more you learn, uh, the fitter you get, 
and that's how everything comes together. Um, and that's kind of probably my, my sum up <laughs> of everything. Um, it's exciting to see where the sport is going. I feel like we've had a huge surge of, um, of interest in it. I know from a, from a coaching perspective, I, I it's nonstop with the emails right now of, um, people just wanting to get into it and want to train. I think it's exciting. We'll see more, more races pop up. Um, and I, I think it's a unique person who chooses to come into the sport and, um, we're at a really, really exciting time with it. So, uh, encouraging everybody, don't be afraid to reach out to veteran racers, people who have experience, ask your questions. Uh, it's a very open and friendly community. So I look forward to seeing more people get into it and, uh, to our borders opening and a lot more mixing and, and crossing of, of, uh, seeing everyone at the races. Jen, you said the speed will come. I've been doing this 21 years. So what, like, is it year 22 or, or when do I get that speed? I think we got to look a little closer at maybe what you're doing for training at this point. And uh, we will have a little one-on-one -on -one conversation with that. Uh, so where can one find you uh, if they want to, if they want to join you to, to uh, for some coaching? Uh, yeah, everything is uh, just my name, jenseger.com. And I do a lot of one-to-one -one coaching. Um, I know I do a, lo do a lot of work also with um, female endurance athletes. That's become a sort of a, a specialty just as we learn more about the female body uh, and how it can train for endurance and, and keep it safe. Um, but also I'm working on some um, courses right now to make even just coaching more accessible. So if one-to-one -one coaching is a little out of the budget, uh, you know, I'm looking at some uh, sort of just take and go programming for adventure racers because it is unique. Um, and yet I don't want training to, and proper training, uh, to be a barrier to entrance. So I'm sort of looking at a much more affordable option of just some really good guided work that will still help you understand how the nutrition piece plays in, how you can safely build and improve your fitness. Uh, so that's all, that's all coming down the pipes. Great. Thank you. Uh, Brent, Jen mentioned she's excited about the future of the sport. Uh, and, and you, you talked a bit about USR, USARA, but what would you like to say, uh, to our to all the event races out there watching. Well, mostly just thanks for chiming in. And I, I hope this is a resource that other new racers find their way to over time. Um, I, you know, I don't have anything all that groundbreaking to add to what Brian and, and Jen have given us here at the end. I, I think that I would just emphasize that community is the greatest part of this sport, whether it's your teammates or the teams you become friends with or the teams you don't know, but you meet. Right. I, I don't know of another sport where you can get um, world champions and rookie racers rubbing shoulders on the start line and actually talking to each other. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just a really special community. So, you know, I think I would just end by saying we've talked a lot about kind of like the advice we would give and maybe some of the ideals that we would give, uh, ideal advice we would give new racers. But, you know, for so many of us, like when we started in the sport, nothing was ideal right? We, we didn't paddle train. We didn't eat right. We didn't have the right bike. We didn't have the right gear. And we still all fell in love with the sport and kind of had a great time. And, you know, over the course of, you know, dozens of races and, you know, tens of years, we figured things out, right? But we're all still figuring things out. Uh, we've said ad uh, adaptation is crucial several times tonight. And, and that remains true even for those of us that are the most experienced. There's always something to learn. So just jump into it. And we didn't get to talk about nutrition, but uh, I think it was Ian Adamson who once, uh, uh, I remember him saying, when you're, when you're getting ready to get food for a race, you get to go down all the aisles in the supermarket that you usually don't get to go down. Uh, um, but thank you all, all for joining us. You can find more about USARA at USARA.com. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on YouTube. And hopefully you will find us uh, again on some of these USARA live forums. I'm William Wild Bill Donahue saying adventure on. And my computer's been like doing this responding thing. So I don't even know if I can turn this off uh, <laughs> or not responding thing. Um, but thank you all very much. Uh, and uh, let's talk again soon.